Hello! This video is part of a series on the history of Dalriada. This is part of the Advanced Higher History course uh, from the topic of Northern Britain, 0 AD through to 1063. This video is going to look at the culture of the Scots, everyday life in early medieval Dalriada. In an early medieval period, Dalriada is a land of farmers. According to Alcock, the population of Dalriada, which is pretty close to the territorial boundary of modern Argyll, uh, would have been around about 20,000 people. In modern times, Argyll's uh, population is around about 50,000, so that gives you an idea of how full the landscape would be. There would be very few population centres and certainly nothing on the scale of what we'd recognise today. So the population is spread more evenly across the landscape. Now, Argyll is an archipelago. It is a chain of headlands and islands cut with deep sea loss uh, and covered in hills and mountains. Farmable land is at a premium. So these farmers would have been spread far and wide across the landscape on any land that they could have used. We know that they grew cereals such as barley and oats. They were also pastoral farmers, they relied on herds of animals, they had small cattle, they also used small horses called garrons. Uh, they used pigs and sheep, they also farmed deer, and they fished. Uh, from charred oats, the archaeologists have found the Danad, we also know that they were using oats and making porridge. So this video is going to look at the evidence for what everyday life was like in early medieval Dalriada. So we're going to start off with settlement evidence. What is there in the archaeological record to show where these people were living? So starting off, the settlement evidence really that we have surviving is based on prestige structures. The dwellings of the ordinary and the, the average everyday people don't tend to come down to us in the archaeological record. Most of what we got are significant structures and centres of power. So we have Duns, Forts and Cranogs remaining in chief and only a few hundred examples from across the entirety of Dalriada. These are the dwellings of the upper classes. This photo here in the background is a picture of Danad, the royal centre of Dalriada. And that figure on the left, there's two of them, is me running across my friend taking a panoramic photo. More on Danad a wee bit later on. Let's start at the bottom of the scale, we look at small duns. An example here from Ardefour. This would have offered communal familial living. You can see the ring-shaped stone enclosure. Inside would have been a wigwam-like structure covered with uh, a roof of heather or thatch. There are stone querns found in here which uh, signify to us that agriculture is taking place and they're grinding grain to make bread or flour for wheat. This is a reconstruction of what one of these may have looked like. So the enclosure might have been used to keep uh, pastoral animals in, maybe to keep them safe from local predators or to stop them wandering so they could bring them in at night. Um, it's unlikely it would have been a defended enclosure as the wall would probably have been too low. Um, however, it does provide an enclosed space for the family to keep their you know, viables close at hand. The thatched area inside may have housed several families worth of people, but bear in mind that uh, life in the early medieval phase is probably spent predominantly outdoors. They would have come inside to sleep, possibly to eat, but it wouldn't be in a space that they would have spent hours upon hours on end. Now, larger duns and forts offer something a bit different. They are resident for a prince or a royal family. Now, it's important to remember at this time in early medieval history in Dalriada, we have a domain that is split up into different kenla or regions within the kingdom. Now, each one of these kenla represents uh, what may become later on a clan area, uh, I guess, and each of them are going to have their own leader. Now, we have the seats or the royal strongholds of these leaders scattered across uh, Dalriada. They weren't necessarily always occupied. Some of them may have just been ceremonial centres where the, the rich and the powerful would go for particular ceremonies such as coronations. 
Um, a variety of objects have been found by archaeologists at these sites, um, although we're uncertain of what types of buildings were inside the stone ramparts of these places. There are no timber halls which were popular with the Britons and the Anglo-Saxons of these times. The stronghold pictured here is Donali, just outside Oban. This would have been the heart of Kennel Lorne, in the north end of Dalriada. Other royal seats across Dalriada include Danad, the ceremonial centre of the entire land. We have Donagoyle at the southern tip of Butte, where the Kennel Cow had the royal seat. And we have Danaverty, which is a fortress sitting right on the bottom tip of the Kintar Peninsula, where Kennel Gibran had their royal seat. Now, Danad stands out as the most impressive of these royal fortresses. It is a 5th century dun, sitting on the summit of a hill. You can see it from above here in this aerial photo. The very green grassy top of the hill is the core, the oldest part of the stronghold, and where the dun would have sat on top as a citadel. The site was expanded with terraces and stone ramparts, and you can see in the sketch drawing on the bottom left, the stone wall with the heavy black line is the core, the ancient dun at the top of it, and the striped ramparts show the site expanding down over time to include the terraces a bit lower down on the hill and then we have the outer rampart right at the bottom that kind of grade in the structure a bit further down again. Now this was not as far as we understand a permanent kingly residence. The lords of Dalriada travelled there to receive tribute and to hold feasts. It is a ceremonial centre for the kingdom rather than a permanently occupied capital as it were. Tribute often came in in the form of food and produce from the different minor chieftains and lords across the land of Dalriada. This is at a time when coinage is not being used. When the Romans left Britain, coinage quickly died out after them and it didn't come back again until much, much later on in the medieval period. So in terms of paying taxes, paying tribute, exchanging, we're looking at a bartering system where people are swapping goods. So on the Dunad site, many moles have been found for precious brooches, and more of them a bit later on in this video, um, given by the king to show rank of person in society. Now, Dalriadans loved wearing a brooch, and these would be ornamental pins that would hold their cloaks together, be worn as a badge of prestige, of rank, showing off your wealth and your importance in society as you wore it proudly upon your chest. Um, these obviously have to be made and manufactured though. And the moulds at Danad show that this is one of the places where this happened. These moulds still have flecks of precious metals trapped in the matrix of the mould, um, as found by archaeologists. The brooches are an important tool for early medieval kings to award their nobles, to award their warriors with prestigious badges to show how important they were to the king, so that these men could display their prestige show how close they were to their king, wears a badge of honour, uh, this reward um, showing just how valued they were by their leader. It's an important bond between the king and his servant. Now, control of precious goods and imports keeps the nobles subservient. Obviously, the nobles would want to buy into this, um, this badge of rank, this, this system of patronage, as much as possible, and it paid for the kings to maintain the resources to be able to keep on handing these badges of honour out. Other types of settlements include Cranogs. Now this is a photograph of the reconstructed Cranog and Loch Tay. This was built in the late 1990s and it's still there today. Um, it was built as a piece of experimental archaeology just to see how one of these things was put together and see how long it lasted. I carried out a visit to the Lotte Cranog in 2017 and during the, the guided tour we had there, the man told us that the thatched roof on the Cranog had not yet been replaced. So it lasted almost 20 years by that point, which gives you an idea of just how long these materials are surviving. It's not that they're going to be thrown up and they've rotten through and have to be chucked within a year or two. These are long lasting uh, examples of settlement. He also talked about the timbers and the piers that the Cranog is built upon or driven down into the bed of the loch. They were going through a cycle of being replaced after having been there for 20 years. So you can imagine these structures represent a massive amount of labour 
um, to erect in the first place. Uh, quite a chunky um, drain on resources as well as a lot of timber and trees having to be felled to build one of these things. So it would have paid for these people to keep the things going and to maintain them. These kernels could have been in place for literally generations. So they are large structures and they represent the status of nobles and possibly kings because they need someone important and powerful to harness the local labour, to bring people together, to actually build one of these things and put it in place. And when it is in place, it is an incredibly prestigious structure. Anyone approaching the lock on which one of these was built would see it from miles around. This is a stamp on the landscape telling anyone who comes by who's the big noise here, who's important, who owns this space. It's also useful as a defensible structure. To attack it, you'd have to go across the causeway or else come at it by boat, either which the defenders would be able to hopefully mount a fairly sustained defence against you. This is the inside of the Lotte Cranog. Obviously, the inhabitants would need a source of heat for, well, basically, keeping themselves warm at night and for cooking. And inside, they built a hearth uh, on a clay bed. And this is sitting on the timber piers that make up the floor of the Cranog. Uh, the clay um, raises up the bed of the fire to make sure that uh, flames do not catch and uh, set your wonderful big home on fire. The floor was covered in hay and bracken, which would have been regularly uh, swept out and changed over um, because they kept animals in here as well. Now, around the outside perimeter of the space in the Cranog here, we've got benches for the occupants to sit on. They reckon this thing could have housed up to 30 people at a time. The wattle fences the, that make up the stalls around the outside are compartments that have been sectioned off. so that people have almost like small compartments or rooms to stay in. And there was also a shelf that went round about head height around the outside side of the, the Carnog. And they believe that people could have gone up and slept on there. Now, if they were keeping animals on the floor space, then the body heat from the animals would rise up to those sleeping on the shelves up above and keep everybody nice and toasty and warm and keep the animals safe from cow rustlers um, or even natural predators at night time. One of the Cranogs excavated in Argyll is found in Loch Glashen. It was on the River Ad, five miles from Dunad. Now this turned out to be a treasure trove for the material culture, uh, so the everyday items of what was being used in, in Dalrad at the time. There are signs of mass leatherworking, preserved by the waters of the loch. Um, and there's a question there, was this used by the ordinary people, this citizens of Dalriada for trading with these royal centres? Were they swapping their leather goods that they've obviously made from trapping animals and uh, basically living off the, the natural landscape around about them? Are they therefore trading these for other items uh, that would have been imported into the royal centre? Turns out that wooden items were much more common than pottery in Dalriada. So we can see some examples here of bowls, troughs, buckets, spoons and paddles that were being found. Now these were caught in a layer of an aerobic earth at the, the bed of the loch. It meant they were trapped without oxygen, so the bacteria that usually break down organic items over time was not able to get to work on these items. That's the reason why they have survived. Now, these are unusual conditions. They are not commonly found across um, Argyll in sites that archaeologists dig in. In fact, the soil, if anything, tends to actually actively erode organic items. So we've locked out here with this uh, discovery. What this could point to, though, is that the, the common material culture across Dalriada is that people were using wooden items, leather items, biodegradable items in their day-to-day -day lives. And the reason that we don't know much or have much that survived down from Dalriadan culture is that so much of it has just decomposed, rotted over the years, and has been lost. Now, we do have some evidence of continental pottery. So this is stuff that has been imported in. Ceramic items have come from perhaps Gaul or modern-day France, brought into Dalriada. But this shows high status. If you've been able to pay to have something imported from uh, continental Europe, then you've got wealth, you've got importance. So when we find examples of pottery, it points to uh, people with high prestige 
we must have been able to afford to buy it in in the first place. Now this is a flattened out piece of a leather satchel, a leather bag that was found in the bed of the lock at Loch Lashen. Now items like this are fascinating because even though this is just a, just a shred, we can see from this what your average everyday people wore during the early medical period or even before in Dalriada. We have a little window into the lives of everyday people which is so, so rare. So the second aspect of what we're going to look at in everyday life in Dalreda is trade and economy. So what made business basically tick over in early medieval Dalreda? So we have detected that they had links with continental Europe, which may be a surprise considering how far north we are up in, in Britain. There's a trail of pottery and glass vessels reaching up the Irish Sea from the west coast of Gaul or modern day France all the way to the west coast of northern Britain up in Dalriada. Dalriada is part of this trading network. So the pottery that is coming up is more advanced than the insular Anglo Saxons. So that means the stuff that the Anglo Saxons in England are turning out is a lower quality and much more basic than the stuff that we are finding up in Dalriada. So I guess the aftermath, the tail end of the Roman Empire, there's still a bit of uh, technology and civilization uh, on the go and functioning in, I guess, what will be Charlemagne's Francia um, and what will become modern day France. They're in a much more uh, advanced state than what England was at that time. And it seems that Dalriada is in contact with these people and is trading in goods from them. Danad has the largest collection of continental pottery anywhere in Britain. And that is significant. Remember, if you look at your map of Britain, today, Danad up in the Comartan Glen looks like it is almost in the middle of nowhere. But in the early medieval period, this is a different story. We are one of the biggest trading centres in the whole of the British Isles. So something important is going on up in the west coast of northern Britain. And this pottery is evidence of a very well established trade network between prestigious and wealthy powers. But pottery is not used in Dariada as we already established, they're used in wooden items instead. So why are we finding all this pottery up in Danad? Now it seems that these ceramics have been used to transport in luxury goods. It's possibly not the the ceramics are an end to a means to themselves is that they are being used to transport in really prestigious and expensive items that these important, powerful and wealthy people in Danad uh, want. So what are they getting? They are important red and purple dyes grown on royal French estates. Now these dyes could have been used to make rich fabrics for the nobles and the prestigious types of Dariada to wear. They may also have been used to manufacture texts by the, the monks um, based in Iona. They're bringing in uh, rare herbs to flavor food. So we're getting coriander and dill being coming, uh, coming in from the content. We're also bringing in rare and exotic foods. So we're getting nuts, dates, and sweetmeats being imported in. Fancy, fancy foods for people with a lot of wealth. These would have been brought in as extras with the main cargo. This is talking about the ceramics and the pottery here. It's coming in with wine from the continent and salt to help them flavour their food. Now, these are all luxuries. People do not need these to survive, but having them allows people a taste of the finer life. It allows people to show off their sophistication, uh, which in itself is a badge of prestige. You can invite people over from the nearby lands and kingdoms and you can invite them to your dinner table and look at all these fabulous foods that you've laid out on the table here. These things came from continental Europe. Look at that, there's something from North Africa over there. This would blow the minds of your guests. It shows off your sophistication. It shows off your wealth. It shows off your contacts with the wider world. It makes the host look fantastic. So these are all prestige statements, these luxury goods you're bringing in to show off as much as you are to enjoy them yourself.
So who is involved in this network of prestige items? As the map shows, we can see these goods are being brought up from the west coast of what we call France. Now on the way, they're stopping at the Silly Isles, and we've got centres in Cornwall, the south coast of Wales. Ireland has trading centres with these guys. We've got them in Dumfries and Galloway, the Isle of Man. And then they're coming up, and there's a massive trading centre we can see from the size of the dot in Danad. Now these are French traders. Their cargo containers uh, have been found up in Danad. This is pottery and glass. A Domnan, who was St. Columba's biographer, he was writing in the 7th century AD from Iona, where he was the abbot of the community there. He mentions Gaulish traders coming up and sailing into Dalgadon waters to trade their goods. Now there's custom to royal sites. It makes sense these traders are coming to royal sites because that's where the money is. That's where the power is. That's where the people who can afford to buy their goods are. So it makes sense that we're finding evidence of these items being deposited and used there. So larger quantities remains of continental trading goods are found there. There are less on church sites. So we think possibly from that, that the kings are the ones that are importing all these luxury goods and they are giving them as gifts to the church, but it's in their control what the church is getting. And these are gifts of patronage and in return, the church is giving back prestige to these rulers by taking part in ceremonies such as royal inaugurations or crownings, christening the, the new royal babies that are coming in basically giving the authority of the church to the kings in exchange for fancy items and goods. These could be dyes to help them uh, colour and draw in these gospels and bibles that the, the monks became famous for producing. So how are people in Dalriada buying these fabulous goods that are coming in? As I said before, coinage died out pretty much within a generation of the Romans leaving. So we are relying on a system of barter or exchange. There is, however, little evidence of this barter or exchange at the other end of the trading um, link over in Gaul or Francia. Um, why is this? That means that the Dalriadans, in exchange for these luxury goods, are giving something that doesn't leave any mark in the archaeological record. So it has been speculated that possibly they were trading slaves. So they may have been taking slaves from surrounding people. So it could be raids into perhaps Pickland to get slaves to bring back. It could be raids into the, the Britons of Strathclyde, producing captives that they could sell to these uh, Frankish merchants to take back to the continent. Or potentially they are barching with natural resources. So we saw in the Loch Lash and uh, Cranog, there was evidence of leatherworking and items being made out of wood. There's a possibility that Leathers, perhaps even furs, or even fine wooden items could have been produced on the large scale in Dariada. They don't survive very well, as I said, in the archaeological records. So that's why we're not finding them up here. But if they were being taken back by these traders back down to Gaul and Francia, they wouldn't survive in the archaeological record down there either as organic items. So the Dariadan end of this uh, trading contract doesn't survive in the record, but it must have been there. These traders are not coming to Danad to drop off their items for free. They must have been getting something in return. So if we have so much evidence of these luxury items coming into Dalriada, how are they using them? So first of all, let's talk about gifts of luxury from the king. Now, there are a large amount of luxury goods or evidence of them being found at royal sites, but only a few at smaller sites like that Dun we looked at earlier on, the Art of or the Law of Glash and Cranog. It makes sense that these presti prestige items are being brought into royal centres like Danad, and it's interesting to note as well that Danad, the Comartan Glen, is only a few miles away from the shore of uh, Loch Fyne uh, on its eastern side, and it's within sight of the sea on its western side, um, overlooking the sound across to Jura. So it's easily accessible by the sea. So these goods can be brought to the royal centre, and from there, the kings are going to, as I spoke about earlier on, uh, give out gifts of patronage. They might also be trading goods out as well, swapping something for something, this bartering system. Um, so it makes sense that smaller settlement sites across Dalriada have smaller quantities of these goods. They don't have as much wealth to swap things with the royal centres. So, um, 
if it's been disseminated across the kingdom through bartering and through trade, that's one way. Also through the kings giving out gifts of patronage to their nobles and their chiefs to honour their loyalty or honour their service. Another way that the purchase could be used is to be given as gifts to the church. Now, having the authority of God behind you is a useful thing to a king. And it would have paid them to keep the, the monks, the priests uh, of the monasteries on side. But how would the churchmen have used these gifts? They used the dyes and the paints that are imported in. And remember, some of these, such as lapis lazuli, the blue pigment they used in their gospels, that comes from as far afield as Afghanistan. And that ain't going to be cheap. So that's got to come from somewhere. So if the kings are lashing out to uh, spend their coin or spend their gold rather, um, to get in colours such as these for the Gospels. This is where it's coming from. They're going to send dyes and paints to the monks to make their manuscripts. They are going to give fancy French wine to the monks for their ceremonies. And we give the, the bread and the wine as in the, the blood and the flesh of Christ. Um, they're doing Passover resources in exchange for favours. So that you want to have the priests on your side. An example of that would be Columba when he came to found his monastery in Iona. He was himself a prince of the, uh, the Northern Irish and he brought with him um, a lot of prestige and power, political and religious as well. So it would have paid for local rulers to have men like Columba on their side. So you do that by giving them gifts and those aren't going to come cheap. So they'd be giving exchanges. Um, so they'd give the monks wine, they give them these fancy pigments, and in return, the monks would produce documents and the kings get prestigious burials on Iona, closer to God. On Iona, there's a burial site called the Relic Oran. This is where the kings of Northern Britain liked to be buried. I remember the cult that um, St. Columba established on Iona, the Celtic church became massive across northern Britain. And it was the, the main strain of Christianity until it was really faced down by Roman version of the church um, from about the 660s. So even then, um, Columbus church was definitely the spiritual powerhouse in northern Britain for centuries. And it was the holiest of holy places in the land. And the kings most certainly wanted to be buried there if they could. Now this is the site today. These are the latest structures that stand on it. But uh, we've got the Benedictine Abbey from the 12th century in the background. The Relic Oran is in this area here just in the foreground. The burial place of kings. And we don't have the actual specific graves. We don't know where they are within the Relic Oran of the kings, but the following slide is going to give us a list of some of the kings that were buried there. There are, however, still a selection of really ancient graves that you can see, and you can see in the top right hand side, we've got um, Lords of the Isles have been buried there, and you can see their effigies on their tombs. These are a list of some of the kings of Northern Britain who, for their, their prestige, for their uh, close ties to God, wanted to be buried on Iona. We've got some surprise inclusions there as well. It's not just Dalriadan kings or Alban kings, but later on, that are going to be buried here. We've also got Northumbrians, Saxons, are being asked to be buried here. We've got Edgefrith right up at the top there, one of the kings of Northumbria, killed by a king of the Picts in battle at Nechtens, in 685, is buried on Iona. And there the next king down, Brady, McBelly, is the one who beat him in that battle, and he's buried there himself eight years later. The first, or the vaunted king of Alba, the one that brings Dalriada and Pick One together, Kenneth McAlpine, he's buried there, along with that list of his descendants. And one of the interesting ones down the bottom, Shakespeare's villain, King Macbeth, the king of Scotland, is buried there at his death in 1057. The prestigious burials continued after the kings stopped using it and the lords of the isles are buried there too. Now, it's a later unit for us that we start to talk about the Vikings. We haven't really quite got there yet in our chronology of our course, but um, the Vikings obviously are going to attack Iona, as you may know already. 
and that really does have a very detrimental effect on the monastic community there. However, even though the monks are forced to leave, Iona is still a revered and holy place. And if the monks left broadly by the year 900, uh, they're very much kind of cleared out by the Vikings, the Vikings attacks. It's interesting to see you start to see some Viking sounding names um, of people who want to be buried there. Interesting that the Vikings switch from being raiders and attackers to people who venerate the site and regard it as being a powerful and holy place. Um, and you can still see it's in use quite late on. We've got some important people being buried there even in the 15th century. So from the burials, we can see that Iona is a place of prestige. And trade shows us that this is so because the, the kings are clearly given these trade items to the monks of Iona. So what links are there with other areas between Dalriada uh, and the outside world? We've got Cornish tin being found at Dunad. Um, Cornwall was one of the major producers of tin um, for literally thousands of years. Um, so that shows evidence of trade happening between the south west corner of Britain and the uh, northwest corner of Britain. We've got gold and garnet jewellery uh, from the Anglo-Saxons being found there too. The cross on the bottom right is a gold and garnet cross. You can see from the red stones in there, these are the garnets. These are beloved of the Anglo-Saxons. They love this kind of jewellery and design. Garnets are still a precious stone today. This is a pectoral cross, that um, something like the one that St Cuthbert wore on his chest and was buried with. Uh, we've got blue glass and gold leaf from Byzantium in the eastern Mediterranean, up there in the top right as well. And that speaks just how far these trade links went. The east end of the Mediterranean, thousands of miles away. And at this point as well, the Eastern Roman Empire survived through until 1453. So blue glass from Byzantium represents the Dariadans really trading with um, the successor to the Roman Empire. So they have... Links going far and wide. Now, what do the historians think about uh, the culture of the Scots and what's going on at the time? Um, historian and archaeologist Ewan Campbell, um, in his major works on Dalriada, and this man has spent a career and a lifetime um, excavating Dalriadan sites and um, writing about what went on there. He says the overall picture is of a sophisticated trading network integrating the exploitation of local resources with the import and redistribution of commodities from all over Western Europe. So Dariada is a hub of trade, exchanging the wealth and natural wealth and resources of Western Scotland for the prestige items being shipped in from continental Europe and beyond. So the third aspect of what life was like in early medieval Dariada that we're going to look at is their art. Now this is where Dariada truly, truly shines and stands apart from what else was going on in Northern Britain at the time. The insular style. Now insular refers to the island style. So we're talking about the Western Isles and Ireland. Now a mixture of Celtic, Pictish and Anglo-Saxon styles fused together to form this insular style. Dalriada is the centre of this artistic fusion. We are going to see examples of animal ornamentation, complex spiral work and knot work as shown by this page from one of the Gospels produced by the monks of Iona. Now this really is a level above in terms of the artwork that these guys are producing. Now the colours being used on these pages are derived from all across the ancient world. The blues are coming from Afghanistan, which is incredible. What they're drawing on as well is vellum, which is the stretched out hide of a calf. So if you remember as well, in a previous video on Dalriada, we talked about the fact that cows are valuable in the ancient, uh, in early medieval worlds because they are themselves a source of food and they represent wealth. In a place where money is not used, Cows are basically walking bank accounts and to kill one um, to make it into a book represents you realistically cashing in uh, 
your resources, your funds. Vellum is expensive to produce. And to make a book, we're talking hundreds of cars would be needed. So the monks clearly, clearly are very, very well off to be able to produce works such as these. Now, when they're developing this very distinctive style artistically, there's evidence of Anglo-Saxon metalworking taking place at Dinad. We found Anglo-Saxon buckle moulds. So that means that our metal workers were working on site in Anglo-Saxon styles. We have found enameled discs of Pictish origin found at Dinad as well. So possibly we've got Pictish metal workers and jewellers working in Dinad. And the Book of Durrow, which is probably produced in Iona, uh, contains animal ornamentation as well. So the monks are copying the styles of these different international influences um, at work in Dalriada. So there's evidence of local artists working here as well with their Western style brooches. So we've got the indigenous Dalriadan art, we've got influence coming from Anglo-Saxons, we've got influence coming from the Picts, and it's all been mixed together to create something new and something quite, quite incredible. Now, evidence of this stylistic fusion um, can be seen, for example, in the Book of Duro, which we think was made in Iona. It was late, made in the late 7th century, so um, around about the, well, it's gone after the political height of Dalriada, um, but when the Northumbrians were on the rise. Um, we're looking at a mixture of Pictish, Anglo-Saxon and Celtic styles. And we can see um, the zoomed in version there of some of the illuminated text that we can see on the bottom left down there. The monks are really laying loose. Now, if you compare that to what we saw in the previous video on the influence of Christianity, we saw St. Columbus Katak, uh, or one of his kind of personal holy books, and it was mostly text. There was a little bit of illumination where they kind of artistically do the, the first capital letter of a line or sentence to make it stand out. But within a hundred years, it is moving on to this level of uh, art. This is incredible, incredible work. This is hundreds, if not thousands, of man hours to put one of these together. On the right hand side of the shot here, we have got a carpet page of a uh, Kaylee Day or one of the, the monks in these uh, fancy ornamented robes. The Kaylee Day are basically clients of God um, in the Irish church. These are the people you would go and speak to. They're the monks, the priests, the ones that are the mouthpiece of God's will and access to heaven. Here we can see some examples of pages from these gospel books. Now, sometimes they cut loose and they do something called a carpet page, but there's no text. There's just ornamentation and design. And these are outstanding pieces of artwork in themselves. This is the foremost of what has been produced in the early medieval world at the time. There is nothing quite like this being produced on the continent. This stands apart. It is phenomenal what they are producing. And that in itself is, is worthy of prestige. Dalriada is leading the way in terms of art in this period. So there are further examples of stylistic fusion, these mixing of different styles and different peoples. We've got an enameled disc. Now, obviously, this one's not in great nick, but it's been in the ground for one of thousand years. Um, but you can see it has a spiral motif or spiral pattern on it. So this disc from Dinad includes Celtic spirals called Triscales, which are found in bowls and Saxon graves as well. They are made in Picklands, but they're brought to Dalriada. So evidence of Pictish styles in We also have buckle moulds. These are found in Dinad. These are found in major royal sites all across Northern Britain, actually. We find these in Pickland as well as in Dalriada. Um, they're not worn by Gales, the people of Ireland and Western Scotland, even though the mould shows that they're being manufactured here in Dalriada. So why are we making buckle moulds for Saxon items that um, were not worn by the people who are actually living here? They're being made by a Saxon metal worker and it still has tiny pieces of silver clinging to it. Now, an interesting thing of this is, um, during the early 7th century, there was a changing of power in 
the kingdoms of Northumbria and so the king was off and his young sons had to get out before they got done in by their, their bad uncle who took over the throne. They fled and they fled to Dalriada where they grew up as young exiles. Now these princes were raised in the Dalriadan way as far as we can understand. They're raised in the way of the church so they took on Ionian Christianity um, and then when they grew to maturity they came back and they retook their kingdom. They fought against pagans in central England and they helped turn Northumbria into basically the, the powerhouse, the superpower of mid 7th century Britain. But they grew up, they got that education, that upbringing in Dalriada and they brought the Ionian church with them when they went back. So they helped to spread Dalriadan ideas, Dalriadan culture, Dalriadan religion across northern Britain. Now it's possible that these buckle molds here represent the retinue, the followers of those Anglo-Saxon Northumbrian princes when they were living those years in Dalriada. Certainly if they weren't of those princes or their retinues then they must have had some kind of impact themselves and brought people with them and that in itself has had an impact on Dalriada and what was being produced there. This is one of the most fabulous surviving examples of Dalriadan artwork. This is the Hunterston brooch. Now it's kept now in the National Museum of Scotland, but it was found in Hunterston on the southern bank of the Clyde in Ayrshire. Now, brooch mould on the bottom left is of similar quality to the Hunterston brooch, um, which was found in Ayrshire. It's previously thought to have only been made in Ireland. Moulds like this are for large brooches. The Hunterston brooch is easily the size of the palm of your hand. It is about 12 centimetres across as a disc. It is enormous, massive. Wearing that on your chest to hold your cloak together, everybody in the room, everybody in the space around about you would have seen that thing. It is a massive statement of your wealth and your power to have worn it. It has panel decorations of gold. All this is done by hand. The major piece itself would be cast in a mould, but all those details would have been put together by a master craftsman or woman um, to have made something of this level. You can see the sockets where um, precious gems would have been mounted in this, but they've been lost over time. This featured in the 2017 Advanced High History paper. Actually, there's a question on this um, actual brooch itself. It showed you front and back pictures of it. The Huntsman brooch is such a prestige item, as we can see here in these pictures, just how fabulous the decoration is on this piece. This is beyond remarkable. This is incredible. This is one of the real treasures of Northern Britain. It's amazing that we have it. But you can see it is a Dalriadan piece uh, from the front, but on the back there is something else going on. Now, because this was such a prestigious item, because this is such a prestigious symbol of power, of kingship, on the back, later on in the piece's uh, life, it has been repurposed by new owners. Dariada was eventually overthrown by Norse invaders, caused the kingdom to collapse in on itself. And one of these Norse invaders seems to have got their hands on the Hunterston brooch. On the back of it, you can see there are Norse runes carved into it. So someone else from a different cultural background has come later taken this piece and repurposed it for themselves. It has become a multicultural item, even more precious in the eyes of historians for what it tells us. So further evidence of stylistic fusion in their art. We've got jewellery settings at Danad as well. It's not just the brooches found in metalworking shops. We've got deep red garnet. That's that favourite gemstone that the Anglo-Saxons love so much, surrounded by twisted gold wire. This really is almost microscopically small, which is why it looks like it's been zoomed in uh, so far. It seems to have been ripped from a larger piece of jewellery, possibly for recycling. Um, it's Anglo-Saxon, similar to royal burial items at Sutton Hoo, and it may have belonged to a prince.
Now, recycling of jewellery and items is something that seems to have happened fairly regularly in the early medieval period. There's obviously a finite resource um, around when it comes to gold and precious gems and so on. And it may well be that items were fairly frequently recycled over time as they got battered, they got worn. You can melt them down and you can make them into something new. The Vikings also had a habit of plundering and nicking stuff and they didn't really care how nice things looked. It used to be about the weight value for them. So they often nicked stuff and then hacked it up with an axe into equally weighed out segments tragically and then it was about the weight of the silver or the weight of the gold that they had as their share rather than how fine an individual cup or a bangle or bracelet looked. Any further evidence of stylistic fusion? We've got silver headed brooch moulds also found at Danad from the 7th century, so it's the 600s AD. Um, it's based on Anglo-Saxon designs and they were customized to the Celtic fashion of brooch fastening. So they're taking styles from all these different Northern British cultures and they're making something new. They're fusing it all together to produce something that is specifically Dalriadin. So why is Dalriada so cosmopolitan? Why are they the ones that are taking all these ideas and able to fuse them together to make something new? As I spoke out a bit before, we have evidence that there were Anglian princes and retinues from Northumbria living at the royal court in Dalriada in exile throughout the 7th century. So they're bringing foreign ideas and culture with them. As long as they're there, they're going to be spreading their ideas and probably attracting further followers. There's going to be a lot of coming and going around the royal court of Dalriada. We know that Columba, who became very quickly a key pillar in Dalriada society, he isn't staying put. He's moving backwards and forwards. From accounts, he went to visit King Brady in Pictland. We know that um, Columba's successor, about 80 years after Columba died, Adonan, visited Oldfrith, the king of the Angles down in Northumbria as well. So evidence there of major key players in Dalriadan society coming and going, moving across the landscape, crossing boundaries. This is all evidence of the powerful elite of Dalriada being in regular contact and sharing ideas and culture with the elites of other lands. We also know, and this is a common trope of uh, Northern British elite society, it seems that the Northern British royal families intermarried regularly during the early medieval period as well. So we have Britonic princesses and princes marrying Pictish princes and princesses. Dalriadan is doing the same. So there would have been a lot of uh, cultural fusion and mixing between these ruling elites over the centuries. To conclude today's video then, some historiographical comment on the artistic influence on Dalriada. Some Ewan Campbell again. And he said, so Danad was a site where all the elements which made up the insular style, Pictish, Saxon and Irish, were all in one place. Unlike manuscripts or brooches, which can be carried around the country so we can never be sure where they're actually made, the archaeological evidence is important because it shows where items were actually being made or produced. So Danad itself is key in understanding what was going on in the wider kingdom of Dalriada. So that's it for this session. Thanks very much for listening. Uh, see you next time.